In this video, I'm going to review some acute diagnoses that you'll see within the abdomen and pelvis working in an emergency department, either as a radiologist or a clinician when you're seeing patients. So this first case is a young patient in their 20s presenting with acute right lower quadrant abdominal pain, fever, and nausea. And whenever you get that history, you of course want to look at everything, but the thing I always go to first just to rule out or rule in is acute appendicitis. In this case, the appendix is inflamed, and I'm going to point out the appendix to you. It's not always easy to find, but in this case, this is the appendix here. It's this tubular structure and keep your eyes on where I just pointed that arrow and watch as I scroll back and forth. So this is the appendix and I'm going to stop on this image now and point out some things. So this is the appendiceal wall that is hyper enhancing this slightly bright line right above where I'm outlining. That's the appendiceal wall. It's a little bit hyper enhancing. So that's clue number one. Additionally, the appendix is dilated. A normal appendiceal diameter is anywhere between six to eight millimeters at its maximum. This one is dilated. This is how you would measure the appendiceal diameter. Diameter. So it's dilated, it's got a hyper enhancing wall, and it's actually hard to see because this patient doesn't have a lot of fat, but there are just inflammatory changes around the appendix. Like this right here is a little bit of stranding of the fat, maybe a little bit of reactive fluid too. So there's inflammation adjacent to the appendix of the mesenteric fat. And then the last important finding to think about is an obstructing appendicolith. This bright calcified thing here is the appendicolith. So this is obstructing the appendiceal lumen from the colon. The appendix is obstructed, so it becomes inflamed, and you you have acute appendicitis. So those are all findings of acute appendicitis and mentioning an obstructing appendicolith has some relevancy for the surgeons. So they like to know that. So if you see an appendicolith blocking the appendix, definitely mention that. And that's what we have here. And this is acute appendicitis. If you see little foci of gas around the appendix, you can suggest a micro perforation or a perforated appendix. In this case, it doesn't look perforated to me. This is just acute uncomplicated appendicitis and look for that dilated fluid filled tubular structure that has a blind ending, meaning the tip of it is not connected to anything. In this case, here's the tip right here. Notice how it just ends. The tip is ending right there. It's not connected to small bowel. That's how you can be sure it's the appendix. And in this case, we have a dilated, fluid-filled, inflamed, blind-ending structure in the right lower quadrant. So that's clearly acute appendicitis. You'll see it all the time. It's a very satisfying diagnosis. So I have my next case here pulled up. In this case, this is a young woman with acute onset right lower pelvic pain. So as we go down to the pelvis, there are some findings I want to point out. So the first thing is we have this, what looks just like a mass. So this is a mass here in the pelvis. And when I say mass, this could be a number of things. I'm going to scroll back through it to let you take a look at it. And what I want you to notice is see all these little rounded hypodense nodules within the mass. So this is one of them here. And I'm going to scroll back through this mass again to let you get an idea. So there are these little tiny hypodense things scattered throughout the periphery of this mass. So that is telling me that this is the ovary and these are ovarian follicles that are becoming peripheralized within the ovary. So this is a grossly enlarged ovary. And the reason it's enlarged is because there is ovarian torsion. So ovarian torsion is a common finding in young women. Women that have tumors, like dermoid tumors on their ovaries are at risk for torsion, but it can just sometimes happen. And when it happens, the ovary becomes very, very edematous, very enlarged, at least double the size of the contralateral ovary. And you see peripheralization of these follicles. Here's a follicle, again, here that I'm outlining with my mouse. They become peripheralized within the ovary. And when you see that, that's pretty characteristic of ovarian torsion. If you're unsure, if you know, it's not as frankly obvious as this case, you can suggest a pelvic ultrasound where you actually try to identify vasculature within the ovary. You can look at the ovarian veins and arteries and just get a sense of if there's blood flow to the ovary or not. So in this case, this is ovarian torsion. Because the ovary is torsed, the pelvis is kind of inflamed. So you have some, this is just free fluid in the pelvis, probably reactive to what's going on here. And this is an emergency. OB guy needs to be called and they would need to go in and fix this before the ovary frankly dies from lack of blood flow. This next case is a middle-aged patient that has had colicky right upper quadrant pain for months that has now become constant and they're now febrile, having nausea and vomiting. So that history is pretty characteristic of gallbladder pathology. So in this case, here's our gallbladder here, this tubular structure. Kind of reminds you of the appendix, right? You see a hyper-enhancing wall. I'm outlining the wall here. It's a little bit bright. Additionally, there's fluid around the gallbladder. So there's fluid. This is all fluid here up top. You can see fluid along the side here too. So this is an inflamed gallbladder. And I'm going to scroll back through it a little bit to let you get a sense of how this looks. So the wall is bright. There's fluid around it. It's dilated. That is too big for a gallbladder. The gallbladder shouldn't be this big in a normal case in a patient with a normal gallbladder. So the gallbladder is dilated, hyper enhancing. It has fluid around it. And then, so look here, this is a gallstone near the gallbladder neck. 
this could be the culprit that's obstructing the cystic duct and causing acute cholecystitis. So you actually don't need an ultrasound. If you see this finding, you don't then need to get an ultrasound to confirm that cholecystitis exists or not. This is cholecystitis. This is enough to call the surgeon and say we have acute cholecystitis. I think a lot of clinicians think, okay, we think it's acute cholecystitis. Let's get an ultrasound. If it looks like this, if the radiologist is telling you this is cholecystitis, you don't need that ultrasound. You can just call the surgeon. So this is an inflamed gallbladder. This needs to come out and you can make that diagnosis based on this appearance of the gallbladder. So I've got my next case pulled up here. This is someone that had acute onset, severe abdominal pain, and on exam they have rebound guarding and are very distended and tense. So this sounds like peritonitis and acute abdomen. So if you hear this history, you definitely need to be on the lookout. So I'm gonna scroll through just to let you get a lay of the land. Scrolling through the pelvis, now up back to the abdomen. And what I'm gonna point out here is this air here. So it's of course normal to have air in your bowel. This is air in the bowel here, this is colon. That's normal air, but you shouldn't see air that's not in bowel. In this case, what I put my arrow on is air by the liver that's not in bowel. Similarly, we have air in the hepatic hilum here. These little dots are air. And this, so this is free air. This is pneumoperitoneum. So this is an emergency. A lot of times in radiology, you may not be able to find the source of the pneumoperitoneum, but statistically there are a few places that we know to look the stomach, the gastric antrum. A lot of people have ulcers, of course. Those ulcers can perforate in that patient that takes a lot of ibuprofen, has chronic pain, they take a lot of pain meds and they're taking a lot of non-steroidals, or if they're on prednisone, they're at risk for gastric ulcers. A duodenal ulcer is another common cause of perforation. Those two right there are a good place to start. And if you can't find a definitive source, you can at least say, you know, this could reflect a duodenal or gastric ulcer perforation. A colonic malignancy that causes a colonic obstruction is another thing that can lead to perforation of the colon. In this case, we don't have a big dilated colon, so I'm not really as worried about the colon as the cause, frankly, on this case. So I would be much more inclined to suggest something more proximal in the stomach or duodenum. In this case, a little bit of that air is right by the stomach. This is some free air here. So it could in fact be coming from the stomach. I don't definitively know on this case by looking at the images myself where it's coming from, but if I were reading this case in real time, I would suggest stomach or duodenum first and just try to help the surgeons. And of course they know that too. They know to look there. So it may not add much by suggesting that, but if you see pneumoperitoneum, duodenum, stomach are good places to think about. If you have a big dilated colon and a colonic mass, then you really want to hone in on the colon and suggest that the colon might be the cause for the perforation. In this case, I don't think it's the colon. It's probably something more proximal, stomach or duodenum. But this is pneumoperitoneum, can't misdiagnosis. A lot of times you can see this on the upright radiograph with air under the diaphragm. That's what we classically learn in medical school. But this is what it looks like on CT and it should be anti-dependent. So air is not dense, so it'll go towards the top of the body. So this is air at the top, this is air at the top. You're not gonna see free air down here by the kidneys or inferiorly along the liver. It's anti-dependent, meaning it should rise to the top. So look for it at the top of the pictures. So my last case here is a middle-aged patient, and this is a diagnosis that you will see all the time and don't necessarily need imaging to diagnose, but I'm gonna show you what it looks like on imaging. This is a middle-aged patient with dysuria and right flank pain. So you have that history, start thinking about the kidneys, of course, and I'm gonna scroll through the kidneys and I want you to look at the right kidney compared to the left kidney. Notice how the left kidney, which is over here, is very homogeneous in the way it enhances. And compare that to the right kidney. Do you see these little lines on the kidney out in the periphery? There's some up here too, over here. I'm gonna scroll back through again and let you just look at these lines. See how the kidney just looks kind of striated? There are different lines of heterogeneous attenuation, meaning it's just not enhancing homogeneously like the other side. This is what we call a striated nephrogram, and this is acute pyelonephritis. This is a slam dunk imaging diagnosis, but sometimes the kidney in acute pyelonephritis can look totally normal on imaging. So if you have that clinical history, and clinicians would know this, you can make the diagnosis clinically and you don't need to get a CT to confirm whether or not it's acute pyelonephritis. If you're worried about an abscess or a complication of pyelonephritis, so that would be a reason to get a CT. So if clinically it sounds like acute uncomplicated pyelonephritis, a CT won't add much because it could be entirely normal. So it won't really help you. But if you have someone that's had symptoms for a long time or if you're worried about an abscess, then certainly imaging and getting a CT is useful. But this is just acute uncomplicated pyelonephritis. There's not a renal abscess. And the hallmark of that is this striated nephrogram where there's just heterogeneous enhancement. You see these different lines, like it's bright here, it's dark here. And as you scroll more inferiorly, you see these 
wedge-shaped areas where it's a little bit darker and then it's bright. That is classic acute pyelonephritis. You'll see it all the time. And if you're reading this as a radiologist, always mention if you see an abscess or other sort of complicating features like gas in the kidney, like emphysematous pyelonephritis or some other real bad complication. In this case, this is uncomplicated pyelonephritis. So that's all I have. Thank you for watching. Be sure to check out my acute diagnoses of the chest and brain videos where I do very similar things to this and go through some acute findings in those different organ systems that you can see in the emergency room and make a quick diagnosis. Thanks again for watching.